Why don't we get started? It's about 3.30. Um, welcome to the Physics and Applied Physics Colloquium. <coughs> it's nice to see you all here. I'll try and speak up a little bit better. Is that good? I don't have a microphone, so I'll just do it this way. Um, I'm pleased today that we can welcome to our stage uh, Bill Abbott. Uh, Bill Abbott is a longtime collaborator with us uh, here at Stanford in the Solar Physics Group. Uh, he received his PhD and his undergraduate degree from Michigan State. Uh, which is where my family is from, so we have a little bit of a connection there, although I went to Calvin College, which is a little bit of a rival. Um, and Bill has been working in computational dynamics, hydrodynamic simulations of the inside of the sun for, for many years. Although, as I learned at lunch today, he started his career in high energy physics and then was a little bit disappointed when they canceled the big experiment SSSC back in the 1990s. And so wound up looking around for something even more interesting and found the sun. So here we are. Um, Bill now works at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he works at the Space Sciences Lab up on the hills. So if any of you have been there, it's a beautiful location. Um, he's been there essentially his entire career since he finished. Uh, he started as a postdoc and is now a senior research scientist there. Um, so one of those rare people who's basically had just one job his entire life. <laughs> which um, some of us can relate to and some of us are envious of and some of us can think, how on earth could that work out for me? Um, but we're delighted to have him here. Um, Bill is uh, working with us together on our Coffees project. Coffees is a, a, a drive science center, which is a large group uh, sponsored by NASA Heliophysics to in investigate the consequences of fields and flows in the interior and exterior of the sun. That's coffees, and we never say, we never explain it more than once. Um, it's, the idea there is to bring together data, analysis, and theory for the dynamo uh, to understand why there's a solar cycle. So a number of us here in the audience are from that group. We had a big kickoff meeting last week or the week before. But we're delighted um, to have Bill come and tell us a little bit about the sun, uh, why it's magnetically active, why it's interesting that it's magnetically active, um, and, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Bill. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you, Ted. And thank you, everyone, everyone for uh, inviting me here. I'm pleased to be here. I kind of, it's a little intimidating, actually, because I look out uh, a, th a good third of the audience, I'm pretty sure, knows more about this topic than I do. So, <laughs> you know, if they, if they heckle, that's the reason. Um, so, as I'd like to do uh, with most talks like this, I'd like to start from 30,000 feet and not jump into the weeds too quickly and get, get, give everyone kind of a basic overview and bearing of our sun. And I think the 30,000 foot overview is, is the galaxy map, you know, kind of like the campus map of where we are. So I looked for that last night and I um, realized that uh, it didn't look like the galaxy I remember when I was studying astronomy uh, growing up. And sure enough, that's kind of a new, a new galactic look. Um, I didn't go into it too much. I think I heard something about it on the news, but I'm pleased to know that we're in a barred spiral now. But <laughs> we're still out here in one of the arms. And if you then take a uh, kind of a closer look at our 22,000 or so of our nearest stellar neighbors and plot them um, from catalogs onto a, a HR diagram. Um, it, it's kind of a helpful way of, of looking at the sun in terms of a star and, and where it is on, our, on a, a stellar evolution point of view. So this is just a plot of, of luminosity versus spectral class or, or temperature. And it's kind of normalized to the sun here. So that's where the sun is on this HR diagram. So then let's kind of move in a little bit closer and look at the sun's uh, stats on its baseball card, basically. You know, the kind of zeroth order, what is the sun? Well, it's a main sequence star, uh, spectral type G2, roughly core, temp core temperature of about 15 million Kelvin, surface temperature much less than that, at about 5,800 Kelvin. Its age is a, a middle, it's a middle-aged star, maybe a little, little older, older than middle age. 4.6 billion years old. It's got a few years left, fortunately. Uh, its radius is about 700 megameters. It's huge. It's got a giant mass. Contains over 98% of the entire mass of the solar system. It's mostly hydrogen and helium, type one population star. And it has an absolute magnitude of 4.8. So 
in the main sequence here, it's actually a little bit brighter uh, than its colleagues. So now let's uh, cut into it <laughs> a bit. Um, this has gotten a little bit more complicated um, as the years have gone by. Um, I used to th uh, we used to think of it as kind of, you know, the, the, uh, thinking of it as a core, a radiative zone, and a convection zone. But there are super interesting regions uh, in the interior of our sun that make up the transition between these areas of the sun that, are va that have vastly differ different physical characteristics. So, so that the rest of my talk makes more sense, I'm gonna include these layers, actually. There's one of them at the base of the convection zone of the sun uh, that you can call the interface layer or the tachocline. And there's also one near the surface of the sun called the near surface shear layer. But basically, uh, the bottom line is, is the core uh, extends from the sun's center out to about 25% of the distance to the surface. Uh, its innermost, inner, innermost portion is, of course, where the nuclear reactions take place, and that's because of all the super high densities and temperatures in that central region. Um, as you get out from that central re region and uh, get closer to the radiative zone, uh, the nuclear reactions fizzle out. Um, the radiative zone ex itself extends from the core to the interface layer near the base of the convection zone, so it's, it's pretty big, 20, about 25% to 70% of the distance up to the surface. In this case, the energy transport is entirely radiated. And I wanted to <laughs> update the number uh, that I'm about to give you. Um, the, point, the point of that last sentence is, it's, it's, it was always interesting to me uh, when I was uh, learning about this, is that a photon, you know, it just doesn't make its way out of the sun right away. I mean, it, it's very, very dense, right? So even in the radiative zone, it's gonna be emitting and absorbing and emitting and absorbing, you know, because there's so many, you know, things for it to collide into, right? So it ends up having to random walk its way uh, 700 megameters, well, a lot more than that, right? It could random walk in any direction. So I was wondering what the latest number was on that, but <laughs> last night I was looking at some papers and uh, they were all over the place. You know, some said thousands of years, some said millions of years. So take the, this number with a grain of salt. The point is, is it takes a long time. Okay, so um, let me talk a bit about the convection zone here first before talking about the tachocline. So the convection zone is this last chunk here. It extends uh, from the interface layer right there all the way up to the visible surface. Uh, it's optically thick, and that just means it's uh, it's opaque to uh, radiation, um, and it's convectively unstable, so it has a stratification that's uh, super adiabatic. So while the, while the radiative zone is stable and, and it's uh, uh, solid body rotating, the convection zone is unstable and it, and it exhibits differential rotation. Okay, why is all of that important? Well and why are these interface regions important is because we think that they play a significant role in uh, the cycles, the long-term cycles of solar activity. So uh, I'll be saying the word tachocline a bit here, and what that means, it's, a, it's basically a thin layer between the stable solid, solid body rotation of the radi radiative zone to the turbulent differentially rotating convective zone. And there are a lot of shear flows there that may contribute to stretching magnetic field and amplifying magnetic field. And it may be really important to the process of how uh, the sun's active cycles are generated. And similarly, the near surface shear layer, um, which is basically up here at the top of the convection zone, also may influence the global dynamo. So I'll try to talk about that just a bit more detail in a moment. Okay, so <laughs> we're not done. This is, this is the last taxonomy slide here. Um, but the sun also has an atmosphere. And so, so it's been optically uh, thick up to this point and opaque if you're a photon. But once you get to the visible surface, what happens is that, for at least for continuum radiation, what happens is that 
uh, the, the medium tran uh, uh, transitions from being optically thick to optically thin, which just means transparent. So once that photon of that particular frequency makes it to that point, boom, it's out into space and it, it can get to us in, I guess, eight and a half minutes or so. So anyway, um, we were here in the upper convection zone. One in, in atmospheric um, studies and studies of the chromosphere and corona, what's uh, kind of an important parameter of the state of the plasma is, is what, what is its beta? And, and for us, um, beta in this case, means the ratio of, of gas to magnetic pressure. So if beta is much greater than one, then the, the plasma is kind of churning the magnetic field around. If the beta is about equal to, equal to one, interesting thing, things can happen. Uh, they, they can balance magnetic field, uh, excuse me, flows can balance magnetic field. But if beta is much less than one, the situation tr changes dramatically and the magnetic field is in charge and the plasmas are often constrained within structures of the, of the magnetic field. So, so anyway, for the upper convection zone, we're still in a beta greater than one environment. So the surface layers are where this transition occurs. You're not only transitioning from betas, you're also transitioning from that conv convective radiative energy transport um, to, uh, to a, a low beta non-convective environment. Once again, um, there are different um, regions of this low atmosphere, the surface layers, chromosphere, and transition region. And the differences are mainly in how uh, the radiation transport of those layers occur. And, and if you're interested in the activity of the sun and what's going, uh, underneath, uh, going on underneath the uh, layers that we can see, um, it's really important to understand what, it, the, the only way we get information about the state of the coronal plasma, we can't measure it directly, so we need to get it from remote sensing instruments and they're gonna be measuring uh, radiation. So anyway, uh, not to uh, go to, into too much uh, detail, the chromosphere is a very complicated region. It's optically thin to con the continuum, optically thick to important atomic transitions. It's something uh, in radiation transport called a non-local thermodynamic, uh, uh, it involves radiative trans complicated radiative transport. It's a mixture of low and high beta plasmas, so it's really complicated ma uh, magnetically. Um, it's, uh, if you're a numericist, you have to worry about shocks, and there's all kinds of interesting physics. The transition region uh, is the transition area uh, that takes us up into the corona. And the corona is actually fairly simple in some sense. Entirely controlled by the magnetic field. It's really hot. You can get up to you know, 15 million degrees, you know, much like the core in some sense. But it's super dense, or super, <laughs> no, it's super not dense. So it's a, it's a totally different animal. And here, it's optically thin, there's shocks, um, there's physics due to field aligned electron thermal conduction, non-thermal physics, and really, really short time scales. Anyway, so let's move on. So this is uh, the sun viewed from uh, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, uh, two instruments. Uh, the helioseismic and magnetic imager and the astro uh, atmospheric imaging assembly. Um, this is what we tend to think of when we walk outside, right? And you just look up at the sun. That's basically what you're seeing. You're seeing the continuum. Um, you see features of activity as sunspots. Um, but you can look in different wavelengths. And see, these are some of the wavelength bands of the AIA instrument. And what they see is they see different temperatures. Um, they're at different wavelengths, they have a band pass, so they're, they're looking at hotter and hotter, progressively hotter and hotter plasmas. And that usually on average corresponds to um, higher and higher in the solar atmosphere. So it's a helpful tool to let us kind of dig in to the layers of the solar atmosphere. Okay, um, so if we zoom in a little bit, 
the sun gets uh, pretty interesting. And I can tell you that uh, this instrument has been around for a while and it's very easy to find fantastic images of, of really interesting activity. So um, I'm not sure if this is erupting or not, but sometimes filaments erupt, sometimes they don't. It depends on the magnetic configuration. So this guy, I mean, this is a, what you're seeing here is plasma that is constrained by magnetic fields. Um, it's a, it, it, I kind of want to point out that this is a large scale feature. Um, many of the drivers of this activity are at much smaller scales deeper in the atmosphere. So, but yet magnetic fields, magne magnetic flux is conserved. So you can't just have an isolated magnetic field. Everything is connected together. So that's one of the big challenges actually of solar physics is this uh, confluence of scales. Okay, so I thought this one was cool to show you. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is actually a movie. It's not moving that much, but focus on this active region here in the limb. Well, maybe I didn't start it. That's why it's not moving. <laughs> okay, okay, I got my crap together. There we go. In a moment, there will be an X-class flare right there. And it, it, this isn't super visually stunning or anything, but it happened um, a couple weeks ago. So that, that was a recent flare event caught by SDO. Okay, this one's, I, this one's exceedingly cool, I think. Um, so this is a CME that also had a solar flare with it. Not all, oh, sorry, CME is a coronal mass eject, ejection where a whole bunch of crap from the sun gets blown off into space. <laughs> That's the technical term. Um, so uh, this CME uh, was associated with a flare, but not all CMEs are associated with flares. And flares are really interesting and really complex. Um, they're, they're basically, they basically result, well, they can result from a number of things, but, but the source of energy for all of these events is the free, mag free magnetic energy in the corona. Um, flares are a little more complicated. They, they can occur more deep. Um, but the, the physics that's driving all of this is the magnetic configuration and topology and evolution of the corona driven by motions down deep. All right, so there it goes. And you, you notice that's almost uh, the size of the radius of the sun as it goes out into space. Okay. Um, that's only two hours? That if, if the, is only two hours? That's what, Na that's what the NASA site said. <laughs> yeah, it, they, no, they blast out extremely quickly. CMEs can be extremely fast. There's slow varieties of them that um, are usually from longer filaments that, that erupt. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, oh, <laughs> sure enough. Oh, sorry, sorry. There's my crappy flare movie and there it goes. In my defense, I really did try to figure out how to loop this. And for some reason, this new version of PowerPoint, I couldn't. <laughs> so let's look at another CME um, in a hotter uh, bandwidth. This one, let's see, um, why did I choose this? Oh, this is for the post-flare post arcades. So um, again, this is gonna be on the limb. Um, and this was a, a while ago in 2011. Um, so what's interesting about this is, is that, well, I'll just show you. And you, you guys can decide what's interesting about it. <laughs> so evolving, evolving. Now there goes the CME. And this is the uh, post-flare arcade. So it's kind of difficult to interpret these types of observations, right? Because you're looking at things that, sh sure, might be moving, but also things that could just be heating up and cooling down, right? 
So if something looks like it's expanding, it may not. Um, so what's really going on here is that uh, uh, the expansion results from magnetic reconnection proceeding upward into the corona, which forms new closed loops at successively higher temperatures. And so it shows up in the uh, 171 channel. So you have to be real careful when interpreting um, these types of observations. Oh, oh yeah, here's another instrument. Um, this is on SOHO. Um, this is a Lasco C3. It's a white light, white light coronagraph, which uh, occults the sun and is able to observe faint optical emission in the sun's outer atmosphere. And this is the same event. So this is kind of scene two from that one that's coming out. And this uh, expands out into space over about a day. Oh, the white circle is where the sun is. And there it goes, out to interfere with our satellites. Okay, so those slides, um, other, than, other than kind of looking cool, were intended to show um, rapid time scale magnetic field changes. So particularly the flare, I mean a flare can happen, you know, the magnetic re re reconfiguration can happen in a millionth of a second and all the shooting can be over um, very, very rapidly. Um, CMEs are a little bit slower, but if you notice here, activity has these long-term patterns that are very persistent. So this is the past solar cycle and as you can see from these snapshots, presumably from the same time, um, the sun in 2010 was, eh, not very active. Then it got more and more active, stayed active, and that became quiet again. So this actually is uh, the solar cycle and solar activity that Coffees is really trying to understand. Um, it's this variability, but, but it's also the characteristics of the active plasma that we're trying to get at. And some of these Characteristics have been known for years, just from observing sunspots. Um, something here that is evident from these pictures is that one can say that roughly speaking, active regions are com com excuse me confined to symmetric latitude bands across the equator. This is a sorry, this is a, a magnetogram which is, shows uh, magnetic polarities, and you can see that the active regions are kind of all lined up in a line there. I mean, there's a lot of spread here. But generally, this is true. And there's that, and there's that. And they move back and forth. Another interesting thing uh, that was discovered by Hale back in 1919 is that active region bipoles are oriented nearly parallel to the east-west direction, but again, with a spread. And you can see that here. There is a positive and negative. You can see it. Well, you can't see it there. Uh, number three. Uh, on average, the le le uh, leading polarity of an active region is po positioned closer to the equator than the trailing polarity, and the mean tilt angle of active regions increases with latitude. Again, I think you can kind of see it here. Um, this time, there's a much bigger spread. Here's the, uh, this is a plot of a tilt angle of uh, bipolar active regions versus uh, sine of latitude. Um, and this is, I forget how many he plotted, but this was a huge data set. And this is what they're talking about with Joy's Law. So it's slight, but it's there. That's also important for theories of how we get solar activity. Just like I showed you uh, in that previous slide, there's an 11 year cycle to activity and an equatorward drift of active latitudes. So that's shown here in this, uh, what's called a butterfly diagram. This is basically active regions as a function of latitude as a function of time in years. I'm sorry, that doesn't show up very well, um, but this is for uh, the last solar cycle. And the polar field, the stuff that's up here. I mean, if the sun, you know, to zeroth order can be thought of as a big bipole, right? So the polar, the polar field, it turns out, uh, reverses 
um, near the time of cycle maximum. And that's what this plot is showing. So here's maximum, here's a reversal, there's maximum solar activity. And, oh sorry, this is a sunspot number. So very, very predictable, well, I shouldn't say predictable, but very, very um, persistent. Yeah. Oops. Yes. You said that plot was for the last solar cycle, but that was for the last several solar cycles, right? Um, I, yeah, let me check. Each, each butterfly is 11 years. Yeah. Oh, yes. Good grief. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, what did I do here? No, I'm lost in space. Ah, yes, here we go. Okay, so we'd sure like to understand this and we'd sure like to predict it. Um, so uh, this was, so, so what, what's happening here? So, so the magnetic fields are clearly generated by some sort of dynamo mechanism that takes the sun's kin kinetic energy and converts it into electromagnetic energy. So the solar plasma is an electrically conducting fluid and um, that has complex shearing and turbulent motion. So it is capable of a self-sustaining dynamo at both small and large scales. Um, at large scales, the kind of standard way of thinking is that the tachycline plays an important role in dynamo models by basically winding up poloidal, weaker poloidal fields to create those strong toroidal fields that you see emerging through the surface in, in those latitudinal bands. But this is, is not well understood, and predictions of the future cycle are not yet certain, though they're getting a lot better than they used to be. Um, this is a plot of predictions for solar cycle 25. Um, sorry, yes. And this was the observed maximum, um, and these were the predicted um, from, from many different types of models, from physical models to uh, statistical models to machine learning and neural network models. So anyway, we're not there yet. And this is our current trajectory. Um, this is from the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. I'm not sure, to be honest with you, what, how they come up with this predictive curve. I don't know what model or models they're using, but evidently it looks like we're headed, headed toward a uh, stronger uh, cycle this time. <clears throat> um, how do we get information um, from below the surface where we can't really see anything? <laughs> Um, yeah, there's a whole field of helioseismology that has been amazing and it's given us great insight into the interior of the sun. And it's basically the study of sound waves that are generated by processes through the convection zone, all that turbulence that I was talking about. And it's a study of the modes of vibration they produce and, and the, those modes of vibration can be used to probe the interior of the sun. Some of the waves uh, travel right through the center of the sun, others are bent back towards the surface at shallower depths, and a good helioseismologist can use the properties of these waves to, to determine the interior structure of the sun, the temperature, density, composition, and motion. I am for sure not a helioseismologist, so this is something that I hope to learn a lot more about um, as I work with coffees. I do know there are a couple of techniques that are in standard use. Okay, I, I did want to mention, I've already mentioned coffees, and Todd did too, so I won't um, dwell on this, but, but it is a whole bunch of institutions, and it's led here at Stanford, and it's organized around themes of the solar interior, uh, one of the, and one of the themes is uh, near-surface shear layer, that interesting layer that might con, uh, contribute to the dynamo. The tachycline layer also might uh, contribute to the dynamo and flex transport and emergence. <clears throat> I want to concentrate a little bit on flux transport and emergence, actually. So 
if, and magnetic flux is generated by the convection zone and dynamo processes at small and large scales. Um, and as I said, observations of this flux is putting a whole bunch of constraints on our understanding of these fields in the convection zone. Interesting as also, and I didn't show a picture of this, but as active regions decay by being buffeted by all of this convective turbulence at the surface, they seem to decouple from whatever structure they had, you know, when they emerged. Or maybe they, we don't know, I mean, maybe they decoupled before they emerged and then were reconstituted. These are some of the things that we're going to have to get our, uh, wrap our heads around. Um, but anyway, once they decouple, it seems like the surface flows, global and local, uh, guide the evolution of flux patterns. And this dispersal pro product process is important to certain dynamo models as well, as leading, flux, leading polarity flux is transported towards the equator, it, it leads to cross equatorial cancellation, following polarity flux is transported toward polar, poleward, which ultimately reserves, reverses that large scale polar field like I was showing you before. So if we can just think of these things as passive scalars that are advected by all of these global and turbulent flows, it can kind of explain this uh, polar field reversal. And then the theory is, is that flux is then pumped back down into the differential rotating interior, producing the toroidal fields of the next cycle. And the uh, last wordy slide here. Um, so uh, the way we, th so just to finish up the kind of the way that we think in the standard model is that these toroidal fields are generated from the weak poloidal field at the tachycline in the pr presence of that significant shear from the rotation or the differentially rotating convection zone running into the uh, stable, stably rotating radiative zones. Um, then these toroidal fields are subjected to some sort of magnetic instability that produce coherent structures and these structures then rise buoyantly through the convection zone and emerge bodily through the surface in ways that are consistent with all of those properties that we talked about earlier. So there's been a ton of attempts to model these very things. This is a one uh, particular um, effort back in 2008. I think it was one or close to the first um, effort that tried to do this with a spherical geometry rather than in a Cartesian box. So what you're, what you're looking at here is um, basically the result of a simulation that started with a toroidal flux rope um, that was magnetically buoyant in a strat gravitationally stratified convective layer and it was allowed to rise uh, at time scales of active region interior ri rising, I should say. Um, this is a MHD simulation, but it's in, like we often do when we model, um, it's in a particular approximation that allows us to model, uh, to, to do this stuff at a long time scale. So in other words, this particular formulation of the MHD equations filters out sound waves, so you don't have to have a time step that follows them all the time. So this is, this is what it looks like at the top of our domain. Um, so a bipole is quote unquote emerging. And these are field lines um, uh, r run through the flux rope. So that's one way of thinking of it. You know, that, that something got generated down deep, makes its way all the way to the surface and pops out as, a, as an active region. But there's another way to think of it. So some more uh, recent models, uh, in particular uh, realistic simulations of surface magnetic convection show that bipolar magnetic regions can form in the absence of an isolated flux tube. All you have to do is take a horizontal magnetic field at the base of your convection, or sorry, at the base of your domain and introduce it into your boundary, let the convection work its merry magic and behold, structures that look like bipoles form. They just show up. Also, uh, large scale coherent structures can spontaneously form via dynamo processes in a rotating model convection zone. In other words, you don't have to put a flux tube or a horizontal field in there at all. It's just natural, it happens. <laughs> And the convective flows themselves act to organize these structures into loop-like isolated concentrations of flux. 
And finally, ma magnetic flux that emerges as, bi as a bipolar active region can be simply generated by supergranular scale convection cells from initially tor toroidal magnetic flux shoved in through the boundary. Here's an uh, example of something like that. This is from, let's see, uh, Nelson um, et al. in 2020. So this, uh, if I recall, is also an anelastic MHD simulation. It's actually not of the sun for um, technical reasons. Um, so it's, it's, it's actually a sun-like star, um, pretty close, but it's rotating three times as fast. So anyway, what you see is a convection pattern. Um, and this is, these simulations, you can't take, a, take them up to the surface because the anelastic approximation breaks down uh, when the sound speed starts to matter. So this can only go up to about 0.95, the radius of the sun. This, these are the toroidal patterns um, in, in near, the, near the model surface. And these are the fields that just formed out of nowhere. So the nice toroidal ring right where you would expect it to be. So, you know, this is a completely different way of looking at it. And there's many reasons why people don't, why the tachycline way of thinking about the, these things is better and more consistent. Yeah, but, but this is uh, really compelling. And then here's some of the structures that formed from this toroidal wreath, I guess is what we call it. Um, so I, I found that very interesting. I mean, there are stars, of course, that are extremely active, like uh, M dwarfs, that, uh, and I'm pretty sure some exhibit cycles, but they, they have a fully convective atmosphere, or, for, sorry, fully convective um, envelope. So they don't have a tachycline, so there's that counterexample that's interesting to point out. And finally, here's that example of stuff magically forming at the surface. Um, this is something from 200, or 2012 from my advisor, actually, Bob Stein and Ake Nordland. Um, I was looking for, he, he had some that formed larger structures, but I couldn't find them uh, online, so this is all I could find. But there, there's an example of a structure, a pore. Um, here's kind of the magnetogram associated with this uh, quiet sun region. These are uh, really cool simulations because they do the radiation transfer um, in a very physical way. Um, it's an ab initio calculation. It doesn't have any parameters. And it, it solves uh, what's called the radiative transfer equation, which lets you model optically thick emission and, and drive the convection with radiative cooling in a very realistic manner. OK, uh, oh, uh, I just went back up to the corona because I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, more about scales. Um, and I will actually, I'm gonna skip this, I have five minutes, so I'm gonna just so, show you one more, um, let's say one more thing. Uh, why don't we make one super model to rule them all, to take us from the base of the convection zone all the way out to the corona. I mean, there, there, I, I think, and actually I would love to do that. And I think it's probably possible someday, but why haven't we? I think the question for me is, why haven't we done that already? And, and the, the reason is, is all of these regimes are so physically dis distinct and have scales, temporal scales and spatial scales that are so disparate that almost the only way to make progress is to treat these regions separately and learn what you can. In, in particular, one of the things I did early on was try to finally put the convection zone to corona system together because I got so tired of trying to f shove flux tubes into a corona without having all of the physics of all those layers you know, between the surface and the chromosphere and transition region. So anyway, so we worked hard to do that back in the day um, with, a, with a code, and we had some success. Um, the issue issues here, um, especially at the time we did it, um, was trying to get 
resolutions high enough and domains large enough to really treat um, large scale structures on the sun because really we want to couple these huge loops um, to the large scale loops below the surface and try to figure out how that kind of feeds back on itself. But anyway, this is a, this is a recent DECAST observation, which is a ground-based telescope from 2020. And this was something we did back in uh, 2012, I think. So that was at least, it, it, it looks pretty similar, but, but certainly not as good as the realistic simulations. And if I recall, the uh, field of, or the resolution here was roughly comparable to the resolution of this, but I, I, I would have to check. Um, so anyway, there, it is possible for models to try to do these complex couplings. Now this is something um, more brand new, and I'm a real fan of both of these codes. Um, they're doing the problem that I did with some fake radiative transfer. Um, it was an approximation uh, um, based on a gray uh, treatment of a gray radiation transfer equation. Anyway, um, but w what these folks are doing is, like Bob Stein's code, they're solving the optically thick radiative transfer equation in detail, driving the convection in a fully self-consistent way. They are adding some of the complex physics of, of uh, non-equilibrium ionization and the non-local thermodynamic equilibrium of the chromosphere. And what that helps you do is that helps you get a very, very, very good look at the low atmosphere. And in, in my view, it helps what you're seeing at the surface because that way you're, you don't have kind of a false boundary that's, you know, you, you have flux running into all the time, <laughs> right? So anyway, this is a code uh, called MURAM and they've extended it to go into the corona and have all of these nice radiation effects. And, oh, I'm, I'm not gonna pronounce his name properly. I uh, apologize for Blisky, <laughs> 2022. And this is a code that's been around for a while um, from the Oslo group called uh, Bifrost. And this was something that I found from Boris Goodickson that was on a technical report page. <laughs> so um, I think it's publicly available, but it's uh, from the Oslo site. Okay, and finally, okay. Finally, uh, we can learn a heck of a lot about, about the magnetic field at the surface from observations using the HMI instrument. And what that provides you is with a time series of vector magnetic field measurements. So what we're looking at, this is just an example of one from a paper by Masha Kazachenko in 2015. This is a snapshot of the magnet observed magnetic field in a super, act uh, super active active region, uh, 11158. And what you're looking at here is this is the um, magnetic field coming toward you. This is a magnetic field going away from you. And the arrows are the horizontal, uh, the horizontal direction of the magnetic field. So it's a full 3D picture. You get a before and an after, and you get a change in magnetic field right here. So this is the dB. And further from that instrument, you can also get uh, Doppler flows. So you get some idea of what the flow field is in that region. So this is a, these are similar observations at the same time of the Doppler velocities. So if you're, if you're a theorist, um, knowing that you've got all of these super high resolution um, uh, rapid snapshots in time over the solar disk and it's a robust data set, you're thinking to yourself, well, what about Faraday's law, right? So, <laughs> I mean, th there it is. It's the time rate of change of B is, is equal to the curl of the uh, electric field or is proportional to the curl of the electric field. So you've, you see, this is something that you observe. So if you can uncurl this equation, then you may be, able, may be able to get an electric field out of that. And if you get an electric field out of that, it's possible, perhaps, to uh, insert that electric field, perhaps at a boundary of one of these realistic models. So uh, George and Masha and Brian worked on this for 
a long time, and I'm not going to go into the mathematics, but it basically involves kind of a Helmholtz-like decomposition into scalar potentials. And if you do a bunch of uh, um, vector calculus acrobatics, you, you end up with a three Poisson, equation, uh, yeah, Poisson equations uh, that you can solve. And so the interesting thing about this is this is observed. That's the Z component of the time rate of changes of the Z component of the magnetic field from HMI. These are the time rate of change of the horizontal vectors right there. And then the J's and B's you can just solve. So there, so there it is. There's your solution. It's, un, it's un, underdetermined, so you have to add a ton of caveats. You have to su assume that it's an ideal evolution of the magnetic field. You have to take into account other information about the flows that you observe from things like local, cor cor local correlation tracking applied to magnetic elements. But when the smoke clears, you can produce something like this, which is from those two magnetograms and flow um, observations, out pops an electric field from before the flare and after the flare and the change in the electric field. So that's, that's exciting. Um, these, this, you, you don't even have to drive a model with this. I mean, you can calculate pointing fluxes. Um, you can calculate all kinds of interesting quantities to help you analyze what's going on in that particular flare. And this is all on Stanford JSOC, all of these uh, tools and um, data. So it's available to the community. Oh, and here's, yeah, and here's a time series of, oops. Here's a time series of that very event. So this is the active region 11158 emerging at the surface. The, that's the observations. Um, transverse field components, vertical field component. These are the Doppler flows. And these are the computed electric fields that presumably can be used to do all kinds of post facto analysis and uh, driving of simulations. And that's, from, by the way, from the uh, CGEM project, which is a NASA strategic capability. So we, we've made some attempts here, um, and this will be my last slide, we ma made some attempts here to try to extend this to larger scales, and this is the same active region. This is our code, Red MHD, which has now been extended to global scales um, in a spherical uh, geometry. Um, so we did, uh, we ran into issues. It's still an underdetermined problem as a driving problem because a unidirectional coupling also requires thermodynamic information and we haven't got our head around that. But we made a, a lot of progress um, and we've developed ways of looking at our emission or simulating emission from our field line plots um, that compare pretty well to AAA observations, but this was initialized by a magnetofrictional model, and it's a dynamic model that's uh, quite early in its infancy. Okay, that's my last slide. <laughs> I lied. All right, so what, what do I hope the takeaway uh, from this is? Um, I mean, why study the, study the sun, I would say, well, why wouldn't you? <laughs> I mean, the, the obvious thing is without the sun, everything, we'd all die. <laughs> um, but, it, but it, you know, not to be, uh, make a silly comment, but, but it is the driver of the Earth's climate, right? And we're concerned about climate science, particularly now. And it's the source of all uh, non-geothermal energy that human beings have and ever will harness. And it's a great basic physics research laboratory. It can provide a unique window into the physics of magnetized plasma, plasmas and stellar atmospheres in an environment that cannot be reprodu reproduced uh, in a terrestrial laboratory. Not that there's anything wrong with doing, th any <laughs> doing things in a terrestrial laboratory, but the sun is just huge and it operates at different scales. Um, its variability, the thing that I was harping on here, directly Im impacts billions of dollars of high-tech public and private investments and in infrastructure, uh, including but not limited to communications networks, power grids, transportation, space-based assets and global positioning, and military and economic infrastructure. So I assume that's why NASA and the government is interested in funding basic research. But for us, it's just fundamentally interesting. I mean, a whole lot of observations have been taken in the past 
hundred years, and there's so much that we don't understand. I mean, you might think, you know, wow, that's a bad thing. We've been at it for so long, you know, we haven't understand, understood much. But from a scientific point of view, the more data we get, the less we understand, the more interesting the problem is. So anyway, thanks a lot, you guys. Thanks, we have some time for questions. Yeah. <laughs> so we're expecting a whole flood of EKIS data. How is that gonna affect this sort of modeling? Are you oh, it's going to keep up with it, or they're oh well, yeah. I, I mean, the more data, the merrier. I mean, if you're asking, uh, can we handle a flood of data to put in into a model? We we can't do that at this point. But what we can do is we can do these types of simulations at the resolutions and spatial scales that are of interest to DKIST, and then compare with their output. And if somehow we're not matching the the what DKIST is seeing, then we, then we might think to rethink our model. I mean, that's one way that that data can be used. I mean, for for example, you know, the type of convection that I was doing in our model was a very simple um, kind of a formalized treatment of this old idea of of characterizing optically thick transport as in terms of escape probabilities, basically. And it works, it's, you know, and it, it makes a whole bunch of assumptions and it's plain parallel, um, but it gave us a good cooling and, and, it, and it seemed to give uh, convective cells and turnover times that are comparable with the sun. So in, in that sense, if dekist, more dekist observations, it, it gives us more confidence that we can try to use this kind of bogus approximation to, and the reason we use it is because we, we wanna spread it over a huge chunk of the sun, right? So for, for me, uh, more data uh, gives us more chance to compare and make more progress, if that answers your question. In a general way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, from the very small to the very big. Yeah. Um, if I was making a box of the sun and I wanted to do flux emergence, do you think that the people who are doing deep models of convection, can they actually tell me what the field that I should be pushing into my box looks like in a believable way? Uh, let, let's see, let me paraphrase that because I'm not sure I entirely understood. So you're saying you, you have a... I want to make a box of the sun, top of the sun. Let's say, yes, oh, okay, let's say so 10, 15, part 20 of the, megameters gotcha, the surface. Gotcha, gotcha, yes. And I, I'm asking the dynamo guys or whatever, can you please tell me what to push in my bottom bound? Can they give me an answer that is believable? <laughs> well, I think that's what Coffee's is going to be a part of answering. The answer is no, but maybe well, okay. Well, it depends. It depends. So, so you saw some of those um, simulations, right, where uh, they pumped in a, just a horizontal layer and got you know things to coalesce, right? So you could say, well, you know, the horizontal th the horizontal layer might be good, right? Or if you know, we're, if we can, if, if we must, if it must be that the standard way of thinking about how flux emerges through the uh, deep convection zone so that it matches up with all of those observed properties that we have to match up. And if that's the only way to do it, then by God, it's gotta be some sort of a flux rope, right? But depending on how big your box is, I mean, flux ropes are, essentially horizontal field, <laughs> right, so. I'm, I'm sure that didn't answer your question. <laughs> I'm gonna ask it again. <laughs> yeah, Irina? Hi, yes. thank you for uh, talk. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, flux emergence. And in particular, I'm interested in how you see, in your opinion, how affect uh, near surface share layer on dynamics and structuring of emerging flux? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, my honest answer to your question, Irina, is, is I, I don't know. And I, I really look for, forward to learning a lot more about the tachyc line and the near surface shear layer, shear layer to inform myself of how that will affect the, I mean, it's gonna depend, right, on how these things rise, right? I mean, if they are really these isolated -y structures, that's gonna be, that's gonna be 
affected by the near surface shear loader, I think, in a different way than if it's just a whole bunch of toroidal field bubbled around by different scales of convection, right? So uh, the question is, is well, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> so I have a question. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little yeah. bit uh, just <laughs> because I want to. Um, so in five years, you will have studied flux transport and emergence and you will have applied your models. Um, you're going to couple to other models. You're going to look for to. things coming up in DKIST and elsewhere at different scales. Yeah. What do you think are the things that you're actually going to actually going to be able to learn on the time scale of a few years, um, where you can apply your modeling techniques to the to the new data and interact well, with some of the others who are, are doing these things? Well, it's not my modeling data. It's our modeling data. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to your point, yeah. So. And if I may paraphrase um, your question, <laughs> um, I think it boils down to if you're going to put a Frankenstein's um, monster together from individual models and hope to God the interconnecting tissue from that Frankenstein's monster is working well enough uh, to be robust enough to actually connect something together at different scales in such a way that's physically believable, what are we going to get out of, it, out of it? Should we instead work on the mother of all codes and try to make more progress in that way? Maybe not over the whole sun, but maybe over a chunk of the sun. And again, I don't know the answer of, to that question. Both methods will, will take an enormous amount of effort. And the question, and again, paraphrasing you another way maybe, is how much effort do you want to put into this as opposed to other things? And, and my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I see what you're saying. So, so l let me rephrase what I said. <laughs> um, you can learn a lot from putting models together and, and, and taking output from models and observations and trying to guide your experiments at different scales. Um, something doesn't have to be completely coupled together, and some things may not be able to be completely coupled together from a computational point of view and a phys the physics of the regions point of view, but you can still have one phase of a project inform another phase of the project to make progress towards a particular scientific goal. Um, I think some goals are very difficult because you have to kind of have to do the whole problem to make progress. But there are goals along the way that you can make substantive progress, I believe, in a finite amount of time. I mean, and, and, that, and it can be transformative progress, and that could lead to, in directions that we haven't thought of yet. I mean, for, for those of you guys that don't do solar physics, I mean, these problems have been around for hundreds of years, right? So, you know, so we're just trying to... Hundreds, maybe. What's that? Not hundreds, maybe, but yeah. yeah okay. Well. <laughs> okay, one last question. Well, this is just an out of the blue opinion question. Okay? Cool. <laughs> um, what is harder, the atmosphere of the sun, meaning the whole thing, because it's a big gas ball, right? mm -hmm. or Earth, <laughs> the atmosphere of the Earth? Okay, well, it depends. <laughs> So, from my background, um, I find the 
the radiative transfer problem of a magnetized atmosphere uh, that has all of these transitions that are not coupled to the thermal pool. So the emission is happening and it's not really related to the temperature. Um, a, a, to do this in multiple dimensions, I, I, I think is a fantastically difficult problem, but it would have wonderful benefits if we could do it and that you could take a remote sensing, blah, 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 blah. But to your point, and I'm not, I don't study that, but there's, you guys have all the molecules <laughs> and everything and, and, and your assimilative problems are also complex because you have in situ points. Um, you're not, you don't, you, you, I guess on the sun, part of the difficulty is there's like 12 orders of magnitude difference between the densities of, you know, the corona and low atmosphere and photosphere. And it all happens in the tiny, tiny space, right? And it's all interacting with, you know, the magnetic field. Um, so I think to answer that question, probably I would have to be more familiar with uh, the system that you're describing. I'm not an atmospheric person, by the way. Oh, well then, oh, if you're not an atmospheric person, no, no, then no, the sun, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a good point. Every, every problem has subtleties. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you, Bill.